and this same uh, directions I want to share today about God's perspective for families. All of us are in families, born in families. Uh, many parents and grandparents are here today and children and we all have something to learn in that because it's important to God. How many of you believe that families are important to God? It is, it is, it is the heart of God. That's why he made the world this way. Adam and Eve had children, and they had children, and they had children, and generation to generation. And God has a perspective on that. He has a plan. And sometimes we, we get distracted, and we think of the things, and we put other uh, things like uh, in priorities, like more important than others. So this way we want to go back to how God looks at families. And I want to start with the patriarch because that's where I think the people of Israel start with the patriarch. And if we pay attention to the patriarch as parents, uh, because we can look at them as different, uh, different angle, but if we look at them as parents, we should notice a, a common point. Uh, they successfully transmitted God's plan or God's intention or God's promise to the next generation. That is a strong point. And this set the pattern for the other parents who are going to come uh, after that. When Abraham entered Canaan in accordance with the Lord's command, God revealed to him uh, that there will be a land given to him and two of his descendants. And these descendants would be more numerous than the, the stars, than the, the sands and the oceans and everything. Later on, we, we find that uh, looking at his life and looking at the life of Isaac and Jacob, we find that they have been very successful in transmitting their faith. Like how Abraham showed his deep devotion, like he would go a place, then he would build an altar, and the way that he treated and uh, dealt with uh, Abimelech and other kings, and even when they were evil to him, he was not evil back to them. And God promised that he would bless those who bless him, that the, the Abraham and his posterity would become a blessing to all the nations of this world. And we find that in Hebrew chapter 11 verse 9, the fact is, is there that Abraham successfully passed to his son and grandsons the assurance of the promise. He lived by that promise. By faith, he went to live as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob. They were living in tents. They passed on a lifestyle. Uh, they could see Abraham. They could see him dealing with people and everything. And they have heard about this promise in the way that they have become heirs of that promise. Not only they have heard it from their father, but God came later on and revealed that same promise uh, to them. And this is very important. When Abraham died, this one of the last comment about it, it says, everything he owned, he left to his son Isaac. You, you read it in, in Genesis. And the most important legacy that Abraham left is that the God of Abraham became the God of Isaac. This was successful, amen? That is a certainty that we see. Later on, the Lord appeared to Isaac and made a similar promise. All the ingredients or the elements of the promise given to Abraham is repeated to the promise given to Isaac about the land, the number of descendants, that it would be a blessing for all people and everything. And then God of Abraham became the God of Isaac. Then later on we move on with Jacob and you will find the exact same things. It is repeated again, and the same promise is passed on to Jacob. God appears to him as well. And then the God of Abraham and Isaac became the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is a, a pattern. And this is a pattern for all of us here today. And uh, this is also a, a, a mark that faith has been passed successfully, not only traditionally, but it has been passed in a personal relationship and through covenant with God. And this is a pattern set for us. You look at the patriarch, 
faith has been passed on, the promise word been given to the next generation. So what does it mean to us parents and grandparents uh, this morning? I want to refer to a study of uh, Mr. Vern Bankston, a scholar at the University of Southern California, who spent 35 years investigating religious beliefs, uh, over 3,500 grandparents to four generations. So that's a lot of time to look at how faith has been passed on, has they been successfully, uh, what are the, the most effective methods uh, that have been. So he has studied that and he wrote a book, Families and Faith, uh, describing how religion is passed down across generation and looking at how parents seek to reproduce religious faith in their children uh, amid a very individualistic society. It's not easy to pass on the faith to our, the next generation. But this man, Mr. Uh, Bankston, has studied it for 35 years, over 3,500 uh, people over uh, f uh, many generations. Okay, so I want to bring to you five things that families should know, or should do, or should remember to help us to pass on our faith to the next generation. The first one is that parents are more, have more religious influence than they think. So don't be discouraged, just, oh this generation is so hard, how will I be successful in that? It seems that even though society is changing, the fact of your influence remain. You are the parents, you have the greatest influence over uh, your children. And the most important factor is the spiritual life of uh, adolescent continues to be uh, their, their parents' and influence. Another important factor in this category is when parents are providing a consistent model. Um, if the parents are not consistent in their faith, and in the way that they go to church and read their Bibles and show that they, they believe, they walk the talk, if they don't show that, then the, the children do not have a model to imitate. And that, that, that is just lo logical. In other words, don't just send your children to church, but bring them to church. And you go to church and it is, it is important. And in this category, I want to share uh, commonly made mistakes that we need to, to, to be careful about these things. If you are parents, if you have children here in this room, uh, this is something to, to think about. During worship, we come to Lighthouse, we worship the Lord, and we raise our hands, we sing the songs and everything. Letting your kids act like if worship is only for adults, it's not okay. If the children are sitting, sleeping, playing on their games, uh, the coloring books, uh, doing their homeworks, or anything else, playing with toys, there is one half an hour in the week where these children are welcome to come into the presence of God and be touched, and w they can learn also to worship. So they should not be left on the chair to do whatever else they can do while the parents are saying. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is very, very serious uh, thing. So, oh, but my, my ch the children are so little. They are just children. But the little children, they go to the nursery, don't they, at two and a half years old? And in the nursery, they have to follow the rules, huh? They have to sing the songs of the nursery rhymes. They have to do the coloring when it's time. They have to follow consign and they have to follow instructions. But they are okay at the nursery, they can do it. But at church, they cannot. They cannot spend 20 minutes to 25 minutes standing with their parents. And knowing what they are actually doing here, this is very, very important. So if we want to be like uh, uh, Abraham, uh, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, this is the very least this is the house of God. This is where they can be touched and they can learn something about church life and they can be touched. So if in their mind, this is for only for adults, we're greatly, greatly missing. You know, their brain is fresh. They are intelligent, these little children. You know, sometimes I see some of them sitting here and they look at the screen. Maybe they cannot even read the words, but they, uh, they can listen and they can reproduce the songs. And sometimes they look 
and you have the, your hands are standing up and, and they look and then you will see their little hands going up and then you are clapping your hands and then they will, they will clap their, their hands. They are learning. They are fresh. Their mind is pure. They are just, you know, eager to learn anything. But if they are left with their electronics or anything, like we are missing a, a big, big point. So please don't do that. It, it creates a deadly pattern. Church is a place where families come to worship. It's a place of joy. It's a place of power. It's a holy place. Amen? Amen. So prepare your children. We're going to church, what the church is, why do we worship, what happened when we worship, and th the time to do it is in the family devotion. You, you have a family devotion, I hope you do have that, and that you are sharing some of the truths about it, so that when they come to church, their mind is already uh, prepared, amen? If you look at the Old Testament, you will see how Israel were taught repeatedly and with great insistence to revere and fear the Lord and love Him with everything within, with their emotions, their strength, and they had certain holy place and holy manners, and there are some things they could, shouldn't be doing because the Lord was there. It was a holy ground. So the church is a holy place. It's a place where God, God meet with his, with his people, and his people are made of families, so the children certainly need to be instructed in that. Another deadly pattern is to let exams, sports, or other activities come first on Sunday. If you want to pass on that Christian faith is important, that church is important, that reading the Bible is important, living for God is important, then every time the child will have a, a certain amount of stress, there's an exam on Monday, oh, he cannot go to church, he has to study. Oh, please, please, I raised four children and they never miss a Sunday because of an exam on a Monday. They can study during the week. They can study during the weekend. They can go back home Sunday afternoon and study and everything. But not because there is a, a, an exam on Monday that they are allowed to, to miss church on Sunday. This is showing what? This little child that is growing, missing Sunday because other things becomes more important, is going to get to work. And his work is going to be more important, isn't it? then uh, playing sports with his friends will be more important. Then going fishing and hunting and the hunting season will become more important. And uh, these other activities will be more important. And that will become, uh, create a, a deadly pattern in, in the life of our children. You know, it's also missing the point of another great lesson of faith. You know, come to church first, trust the Lord, he will help you remember what you have studied in school last, last week or in the last month. He will refresh your memory. So when you, you have a question, the Holy Spirit will, will bring it back up. So if you have been a good student in the last tr trimester in, in school, the Holy Spirit will honor you. You go to church, serve the Lord, and go. And then on Monday, the, your brain will be refreshed by the Holy Spirit. Is it possible? This is what we taught our children. Trust the Lord, He will help you in your schooling as well. So that there's an opportunity here to, for the ch child at his level of understanding and his level of responsibility to learn, to trust the Lord and to see how the Lord will help him to succeed in this exam. This is a lesson, a spiritual lesson for his life that will impact him at this level instead of missing it and showing him uh, uh, the opposite there's no lesson if, if you li leave it at home on Sunday morning, you are missing a great, great point. It grieves me every time. I, I must uh, speak the truth like, uh, from my heart as a pastor. It grieves me a lot when I find out that there's a child that is studying at home instead of being at church on Sunday because there's an exam next week. It really, really grieves me. Amen. Anyway, let's move on. Point number two, fervent faith cannot compensate for a distant dad. Parents who are warm and loving are more likely to pass on their faith than those who are only authoritarian. I think th this, is, this is only logic, but this is the result of 35 years of studies to find out this, 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 this truth here. This is important. An absent or uninterested dad or spiritually absent dad is very difficult to compensate for. 
even though the mother is very zealous religiously. That is the result of the study. Many times mothers are kind of holding on, and it should not be like that because the, the leadership of the family, the headship has been given to men, but many times men leave the woman to do it, and they are kind of following or being absent and uh, these kind of things like my wife is doing it very well and this is not, not be, be like that so the quality of relationship between the child and the parent affects the success or lack of success and transmission transmission of, of the faith so the father the role of the father is extremely important but the role of the mother is even more important and in that sense if the husband is missing then the mother has even a greater responsibility and God is there the Holy Spirit is there and, and this is very very important there's an example that the uh, uh, father was very religious and in this uh, church group they were very strict with traditions and they would not allow any slippage of of his five children and one of his son went to be a missionary and while he was on the mission field, he had a nervous breakdown, and he was sent home. And his father was furious about him, because he looked at his son like a failure instead. And you know what happened? This son left the church forever, because of a negative, such a, a hard uh, encounter with his, with his father. So that's why uh, a, f a, f a warm and loving parents are more likely to pass on the faith successfully. Number three, allowing children religious choice can encourage religious continuity. So let, let, me, let me say something here. The ideal situation is that this child is growing in a tight-knit religious community. Uh, the, the parents, the grandparents, the uncles, the cousins are Christians and there is this environment that's uh, the ideal situations to support and to uh, impact the transmission of faith. But at the same time, it is part of the psychological development of every human being to a child follows blindly. You do this, you go there, you listen to this, you just obey. Why should I obey? Because I says you have to obey. You know, that's a child. It's, it's okay. This is how a child works. You need boundaries, you need consistency, and you need to give instruction. But comes a time when the child starts, why should I obey? Why shouldn't I? And then compare with other friends. But my, but my friends, you know? And then the, the world and the universe of this child starts to, to conflict with, with this reality. So what do we do in that time? Should we be very only authoritarian? and very like uh, prohibit everything or have uh, intelligence discussions answer questions and uh, explain something like uh, you know we want your faith to be your own okay but we believe that we have found the faith that is the most meaningful to us and to you and to our family but we don't want to impose it on you and at times, there will be children who will be kind of, kind of going away without going away. You know, like they will be looking at other things, like looking at what other people think and everything, and be, be challenged for a number of years sometime. And it, it plays mom and dad in a very frightening position, and we are concerned and everything. But a soft-minded approach by the parents are generally more successful in the long run than only strict prohibition. And children uh, explore the what's and why's of their parents' faith. And even though it makes us uncomfortable, at the end, they're not going away. They are questioning. And I told you not a few weeks ago about my, my, my daughter when she went to uh, do a master degree. She came very close to going away. Uh, in terms of understanding, choosing, questioning faith, questioning the, the way that we raised her, not by rejecting it, but as seeing it, as this, this is not my faith, this was your faith. I was following your faith. And then she had to go through that, and she never went away, and she is following the Lord, but she, she went through a phase like this. Number four, don't forget the grandparents. I can see many grandparents here this morning, so 
sometimes I'm the only one in the first service that is uh, uh, older. The other day, someone says, who's the oldest in this room here? And it was me. <laughs> and I felt very weird for the first time. It was me, and I, you know, wow. <laughs> so maybe this morning I'm not the only one here. Yeah. <laughs> so don't forget the grandparents. This and the book, and the research of this book has been the most eye-opening theme, uh, according to the writer. It says, grandparents play a very, very important role in reinforcing faith in their grandchildren. Even at the times when the parents are struggling with negative role models. And that, this is something very important. Okay, let's say, for instance, uh, the parents are going through a divorce or like a, a very intense uh, time or the depressions, uh, quitting a job, being been fired from a job, uh, financial difficulties or whatever it is. During this time, the parents are not playing a positive role model of faith, of transmitting faith because they are in a crisis of their own. But the grandparents are there. The grandparents are, are the, the stabilizing uh, factor in the life of the child, and they are praying, and they are bringing words of comfort and words of encouragement. And in spite of sometimes a, a time where the, the, the struggling time of a negative role, parents of parents, grandparents can compensate over that. And this is very, very important. It makes sense. If our children are around grandparents, uh, and aunts and uncles and cousins who believe it becomes a more natural way of life. And grandparents today can and want to have a greater religious influence in the lives of their grandchildren. Almost four in ten of the grandchildren were in the same faith tradition as their grandparents. And I know by experience when I traveled in China, you know, they had this horrible time of the, the Cultural Revolution that took away a uh, whole generation of faith. It, they, they just went to prison, they, they broke families, they went them on the farm and everything. But many of this generation that came after the Cultural Revolutions who turned to Christianity, when you talk to them and you try to ask them, uh, how, how did you come to the faith? Like, wh what are some of the things that led you to believe in Jesus? And many, many, many stories that I have heard in China. I had a grandmother who used to take me to church. In many, it is, it is very remarkable, the importance of grandparents. However, sometimes there is a skip generation effect where grandchildren follow the faith of the grandparent instead of the parent's example, because sometimes the parents are not Christian, but the grandparents are, and in some cases, even and not having Christian parents, the role of the grandparents will make that the children will follow the faith of the grandchildren. Because they have seen it, they have seen that it works, they have learned something. Number five, don't give up on prodigals because many do return. They, this, is, this is a hard time and many, uh, many parents will have experienced that. We had four children, one of them went straight on the other side, very far away, and it broke our hearts. And sometimes I was so discouraged that I was ready to quit the ministry and walk away. And I, says, I cannot even run my own family, so how can I, you know, be a pastor and things like this? And it's, it's heartbreaking. But children do return. And one of the lessons that I have learned in these years of struggling with this uh, rebellious child that we had, Every time I was ready to quit, my heart was broken and I didn't know where to turn and I felt that there's no more resources in my life. Every time I would talk to someone, God would send me like angels or people that older, like Pastor Steve, Sister Mary, other missionaries, Aaron Rod Ganger that I worked in China with and others, people or people that I just met, other Christian parents that would have been going through similar situations and the message that I have received through reading the Bible, reading books on teenagers, uh, you know, like all kinds of counseling books or, or conversation with people, one message kept coming back. Keep loving and keep your door open and keep your heart open. And be ready when your child is ready to talk. Because sometimes you want to talk to your child 
you want to uh, have the child explain to you what's going on in his, in his brain. He's, he's not following with you. You want to understand and you cannot understand and you want to talk and they don't talk. They're closed. It, it doesn't work. Even though you tried any method, it's not going to work. But someday they just show up at, for breakfast in the kitchen and they just want to talk. And you are not, your hair is just like this. You even even <laughs> brush your teeth. They want to talk. You need to talk on that time. So don't give up on prodigals. And one thing that I have also appreciated in Lighthouse, when my daughter was at the worst time, you know, sometimes she would go outside of Lighthouse here, and then she would go and smoke, you know, things like that. Yeah, it makes us so embarrassed and everything, and we were so... <laughs> but never, never anybody in Lighthouse have been picking on her or picking on us or blaming or condemning, but everybody in the environment of the church life that she has come at with in contact with has always been loving. And today she loves us very, very, very much. You know, she's one of our best and be beloved daughter. But you know, it, it was hard, but love remained the key. You know, sometimes I, I even I'm sorry to say that maybe I will shock you. I was so discouraged and so angry and frustrated, that, and I felt so helpless. Sometimes I felt like I'm giving her away. I'm sending her out of my house. I, I cannot, you know, uh, hold on anymore. I just like, I'll send her to Canada, I'll send her anywhere else, but just a way I could, just couldn't. But it, it, it never happened, of course. But it, 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 these things come, come into our mind. But the message is that always keep your heart open, and keep your door open also, and then so that they can uh, come back. Amen? Amen? Prodigals, come back because they know that if they come back, they will be loved and, and they will be accepted. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Some other factors on the next slide. Why uh, some parents are more successful in passing their faith while others are not. Some just general statement. Uh, intact families do better than families with divorce. That's, you know, it's more easy, you know, than they're being struggling with different parents. Parents with the same faith do better than parents with interfaith marriage. This is also logical. Um, uh, a, f a, a, a father that does not believe is very destructive, uh, even though the mother would believe, or, or of another faith that would be even worse, because there will always be uh, a conflict. Uh, I keep telling young people, if you marry with an unbeliever, or, or a believer of another faith, there, when, you, when you marry, you marry in a family. You, you marry in the other person's family. So if your family is of a certain traditions, culture, and you know, value system, it's easy to navigate. But there's also like a sense of a, a belonging. And you know, who is this grandchild going to belong to? On that side of the family or on this side of the family? which side the family will have the greatest uh, influence? The ungodly side, or the traditional side, or the Christian side, or the religious side? And this is very, very important. Warm, affectionate parents, the kinds of kids that uh, admire and look up to some of the adults, then they will, will of course, because the, the people are looking up to them, so they, will, they, they more, most likely will be successful. Uh, parents do better with the support of the grandparents. We already uh, mentioned that. Another thing that is important is like, uh, and not m always parents understand that. Maybe today's parents understand that more than in, in my generation. Parents who try to connect with their children's heart are generally more successful. Um, you know, each child is unique and like I know that I, I, I made mistake in that category here because I, I had been successful with my son with certain rules and guidelines. So I tried to apply the same guidelines to all of my other children. I was successful with one, so I should be successful with all of them following the same guidelines. Unfortunately, I was not. And my guidelines that I applied to my son was all broken when it came to my daughter. N nothing has worked in that, in that regard. And I missed that point here because we need to perceive what is in the, each child's heart, what they feel for, 
what they aspire, and the talents that they have. Like I have a grandson that is a hockey player, and another one that leave him in his pyjama at home with his legal block, and he's the most happy one. The, if you want to punish him, send him play hockey. <laughs> you know, and sometimes parents, we may, we may be uh, over regarding these, these things. King David was a musician. Solomon studied animals and nature. Dorcas enjoys sewing. Paul was a bookworm. And many of them have been called to serve God early in age. Amen? Hallelujah. And you find that from uh, Timothy also. Timothy uh, had a, a Greek father, a Jewish believing mother. Uh, we learned in uh, the text that uh, he was taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And he has received salvation because of that and wisdom. And we learn about the faith of his grandmother, Louis, and his mother, Eunice, and the important, and, and even Paul says, you have the same faith that was first and your grandmother and your father. The father is not mentioned at all in that. So we may we think that was he a believer, a non-believer, because it says it was Greek. He could have been a Greek believer, like an uncircumcised, or, but probably because the faith is only mentioning the mother and the grandmother. Probably the father did not have it or was very distant concerning that. But the point is that those whose faith had a great impact, the grandmother and the mother. And I want to finish with Psalm 78. I think we will run out of time. That's kind of the most important point I want to make. How to pass on faith. It's a wonderful psalm filled with a uh, lot of uh, uh, advice to us. The first uh, part says, Oh my people, listen to my teaching, incline your ears. I want to open my mouth in parable. Uh, wh what does it say like that? I want to utter uh, dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. You know, the, the, I want to speak in parable. The word here may be uh, proverbs, poetry, or wise sayings. That's the kind of language because at that, that time, you know you have the Proverbs. The Proverbs has been written in a very special uh, uh, writing f uh, format. It, it's a, a way of communicating language that we still appreciate today. You look at the Psalms, this is also a very unique, some of the Psalms are very unique and, and literacy form that it has. So the, it seems that in this time it was a kind of popular uh, literacy format, a way of communicating that to communicate and, and proverbs or something like this. So that's kind of what, what he's saying. What you find in this verse here that uh, a desire to communicate is very important. A sense of mission. If you don't have it, then you, you might not be very, very uh, uh, successful in transmitting to children. He says, listen, I want to speak to you something that we have learned from our father. I want to communicate it uh, to you. And things that we have heard and known. So that was transmitted to him from the previous generation to him. What our fathers have told us. What our fathers have told me has impacted my life. I remember some memories of my grandfather who was not a born-again Christian, but he was a Catholic and a very religious, and they lived their faith uh, in a very good way. I remember uh, one time in the New Year, uh, we went to the ho home of my grandparents, and my mother was there, and my uncles, and they made us, all the grandchildren, kneel, and then uh, my, grand my grandfather lay his hand on us and prayed to bless us. I remember that. This is a, a memory of my childhood. So I, I was transmitted uh, something from my mother. I, I know the principle that I have received from my mother, even though she had not at the time uh, was like a born-again Christian. We, we grew up in, in a religious society at the time that passed on very good uh, things in, in schools and in society uh, to us. So we have to be convinced that what we have heard is important enough to, to, to transmit to others. Okay. And uh, verse 4 to 6, we will not hide them from their children. Uh, look at how many generations you will find in this text. But we will tell to the coming generation, and what are we going to talk about? The glorious deeds of the Lord. We will talk about the wonders of what God has done. 
Then later on in verse 5, you see another dimension of things to transmit. You know, when children are young, this is, this is actually a very intelligent text. It uh, should be used in, uh, in education, uh, Sunday school education, beca because it talks about psychological uh, development of children. When children are young, you don't talk about abstract values of integrity and uh, truthfulness and things like this. So you describe to them the awesome deeds of the Lord. That you know Goli Goliath and David and David helped him, you know, and all of this and the three Hebrew boys in the furnace and God delivered them. And this is what God can do. This is a child. He's, he's learning with the, this graphic uh, uh, picture of, of what God has done, the awesome, the, the crossing of the Red Sea and things like this. But then when the children grow uh, bigger, he says, God has established a law that he commanded the fathers to teach to the, the children. So now we can go to how to live a life, the rules for relationship and society and everything. So we move on to another level of the, of the uh, ch uh, children, psychology and everything. The deeds are the Bible stories. The law are life lessons, morality, obedience, ethics. And then we explain that and we pass it to the next generation that they might know them Okay, and if you look, there's uh, our children, then there is children yet to be born, okay? So they, they are not born, so you have our children, the children that are yet to be born are the children born of our children, and they will tell that to the next generation. So that's four generations, me, the children, the children yet to be born, and tell them to their children. We have four generations over here, the seven and eight so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keeps the commandments and everything. So, and then in verse 8, you have the negative side, so that they can live positive and so that they cannot experience the negative, not be like the negative of the rebellious and the stubborn and the, you know, uh, the disobedience that were punished, but that they would know and that they would obey that they would put their trust in the Lord and live with the Lord. So that is what we, we, we find. And then there is a message for old age and gray hairs. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, message for me, gray hairs. Yeah, <laughs> grandparents and church is very important. This is an individual responsibility. From my youth, they have taught me, I will proclaim. So this about me, my life, even from my youth, to my old age, I have grown up with these principles and I'm transmitting it. And when I get older, I'm not to stop. I'm not going to, you know, not to continue to proclaim. You know, I read before that older people who are retired that from work can do so much more. Because you have life experience, many times you have a bit more uh, financial freedom because all the, your children are taken care of and everything. And you can do so much more. You can travel, you can invest, you can love, you can do things for the younger generation. So even into old age and grace, oh God, until I proclaim your might to another generation. So this morning, God does not expect parents to be perfect, but he expects all parents to be fully aware of our role. There's a role that is the transmission of that faith that he has communicated to us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And one thing we need to know, like in all the, the principles that I shared, never forget that th there's a ideal situations, there are good principles, things that we ought to do, but Salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. So that, let's not forget that. Uh, and even though we may fail, there's a struggling generation. That sometimes the parents will not give the right. And there, I don't know a single parent that would not have some regrets. And if they would do it again, they would do much better this time. But the Holy Spirit is there and he, this all of these mistakes and the failings of parents the holy spirit and the grace of god and the mercy of god intervenes because he wants the children to come to know him so in the, many of our, of our failings there's something bigger than us 
that comes to our rescue to bring our children back to, to him. So God's perspective for parents, we will tell the things that our fathers have told us, the last slide. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord. God commanded our fathers to teach to the children that the next generation might know them and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God. We are in it together and we have a generation to reach. Amen? Amen. Let us stand this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Lord, this morning we pray for the children of this actual generation, the children of this church and the Sunday school. And Lord, thank you for a church that has a Sunday school program to bring and proclaim the mighty deeds of the Lord to the children's ability to understand. And Lord, that later on when they grow and they reach near to the youth groups, that they will hear about the, the rules of societies and how to handle different situations according to their uh, life uh, situations. And Lord Jesus, we want to pray for every parents in this room every grandparents that they will be reminded of the of God's perspective concerning our role and the life of our children and the passing of the important message of life of eternal life to our children and Lord help us to be successful by your grace and by your mercy and by your power in our lives by renewing us and allowing us to live the life that we ought to live and to love and just like you to be loving and warm, caring and, 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 and pray and, and experience the power of God and the anointing of God over our lives. And Lord, thank you that salvation belongs to you, Lord. And thank you for forgiving us for all the failings and all the mistakes that we have done as parents or grandparents. And Lord, change our perspective today, Lord, and help us to realign our, our, our decisions and our ways with the children that you have entrusted to us. Even they are our children or grandchildren or, or uh, children that are part of our extended families or children that are part of, of the church or children that we come in contact with in the society or neighbors or if we work in the schools, the Lord, that we will see these young lives, Lord. And we will feel that we have an obligation from the Lord. We have been commanded to teach them the deeds of the Lord and the laws of the Lord according to their ability to receive it. And Lord, thank you. And make us, Lord, successful in passing out the faith to the next generation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.